is coming a day when no heartache will come. No more clouds in the sky and no more tears to dim the eye. And all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. Oh, what a day, a glorious day that will be. And what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And when he takes me by the hand and leads me through that promised land. Oh, what a day, a glorious day. Jesus' face 
your face But until that day We'll hold on to you always I know the journey seems so long you feel you're walking on your own But there has never been one step Where you've walked out all alone Troubled soul, don't lose your heart Cause joy and peace he brings And the beauty that's in store Outweighs the hurt of a life sting So I'll hold on to this hope And the promise that he brings that there will be a place with no more suffering There will be a day with no more tears No more pain and no more fears Oh, there will be a day when the burdens of this place will be no See Jesus face to face Oh, there will be a day With no more tears No more pain And no more fears Oh, there will be a day When the burdens of this place Will be no more We'll see Jesus face to face Till that day We'll hold on to you always Man. There is power in the name of Jesus There is power in the name of Jesus Oh, there is power in the name of Jesus To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain I hear 
those chains falling Oh, I hear those chains falling To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain Oh, there is power in the name of Jesus There is power in the name of Jesus There is power in the name of Jesus To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Every chain, break every chain, break every chain. He said that in the most oh, there is days, power in the name of Jesus. That he would pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. There is power in the name of Jesus. There's power. Don't you ever doubt. There is power Don't you ever doubt the power in of God. The name of Jesus. He's wanting to do something in you. To break every chain. To break, break every, every chain. chain break every chain. chain. To break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Oh, Jesus, there is power. It's in the mighty name of Jesus. certainly is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Uh, it's already been mentioned. This is Pentecostal Sunday. That simply means it's 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. But thank God for ever, ever since Jesus uh, ascended and sent the third person of the Godhead back here to abide with us forever. It's been Pentecostal day every day not just sunday amen the bible says in the book of uh, ephesians chapter 5 it says be not drunk with wine wherein is excess but be ye filled with the spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and so if you talk to yourself you got some bible to back it amen speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart 
to the Lord, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Amen. Praise God forever. But today we're going to carry on with the thought that we preached on last Sunday. If you recall, we read from uh, Luke chapter 12, the story about the successful farmer. He had more crops than he knew what to do with. And he said, this will I do. He thought within himself. That was the title, the thought that we used then. It's the thought we're going to use again this Sunday. And uh, um, don't get too complacent because the Lord willing, I'm preaching on the same thought next Sunday. And then after that, we'll move to something else. Amen. Used to, I preach, uh, I preach a message and I never did have a series. But here lately, that's the way it's been going with me. But that's okay. Uh, God knows best what we need and uh, all of us thinks about stuff but this farmer thought within himself he said uh, this is what I'm going to do I'm going to pull down my barns I'm going to build greater and when I get all that my goods and fruits bestowed away then I'm going to say to my soul he's still talking to himself you can say to your soul take thine ease eat drink and be merry for thou hast much goods laid up for many years but this guy didn't have the years to enjoy the goods because God said, this night, he called him a fool. He said, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, and then who shall these things be? You know, everybody's worried about what's going to get, what they, who's going to get what you got when you leave. Well, I'm going to tell you, you're going to leave it all, and you ain't got a bit of control over who's going to get it. Amen. Solomon worried about that in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He said, I don't know if the man that's coming after me is going to be a wise man or a fool. Well, it doesn't matter, Solomon. Amen. They're going to get what you got. But there's one thing you can take with you, and that's the only thing you can, and it's what you the relationship that you have with God. Amen. And if you ain't right with God, you better be getting right because I'm going to tell you whether you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, the mid-tribulation rapture, or the post-tribulation rapture, the rapture of the church is going to happen, and if you ain't ready, you can't go. And that's why we have church every Sunday is we want people people to get ready because we're all on a head-on collision course with Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and if we ain't ready, my God, we're going to be in trouble. Amen. So uh, uh, let's get ready. Amen. Let's get ready. I want to read now from uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 8 through verse 15. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, amen, and it says, and it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots uh, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And the Bible said, And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, uh, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, that thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. So Naaman was wroth. I mean, here he's got, he's got what he wanted and he gets mad about it. People, is never, they never change. Bless God. Amen. They want it my way. I remember years ago I worked for a foreman uh, and he told me, you know, he was trying to make this homemade deal with all of us guys and the crew and he said, it's my way or no way. Amen. I, 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 I'm going to just tell you, that ain't the way to get me to do anything, brother. Amen. I, I'll work with you, but when you put it like that, I said, well, boss, I'm going to have to tell you something. It's no way with me. Amen. Amen. And, and then he went to my buddy, and my bu the first thing he said, he said, what did Gary do? And he said, the foreman said, I ain't going to tell you. He said, well, it's no way. Eight of us agreed that we wasn't going to make a homemade deal. Two of us stuck together, and the other six turned on us and made us look like mud. Well, I want to tell you, God will never make you look like mud. Uh, brother, if God said he'd stand with you, he 
He'll stand with you in the fire. He'll stand with you in the wilderness. He'll stand with you in the den of lions. He'll stand with you at the Red Sea, the River Jordan. Hallelujah to God against the giant of death. God will stand with you. Amen. And the Bible says, let's go on and then I need to preach what I want to preach this morning. And Elisha, the Bible says Naaman was wroth. He got mad at the word of God and he went away and, and said, behold, I thought. I want you to remember verse 11, behold, I thought. Say that with me. Behold, I thought. Amen. He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand uh, over the leper, over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abna and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Well, sure, they're clean. And, I, and may I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had asked thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee something simple like go over there and wash and be clean. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God and he, he and all of his company and he came and stood before him and he said, Behold, now I know that there is a God in uh, all the earth. There is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Pray with me. Father, I ask you to bless the reading of the scripture. I ask you to bless this service. I ask you to speak to hearts and lives. I ask you to remove things, Lord, out of here that shouldn't be here. Amen. And let us all hear from that far country, heaven. And God of heaven, we'll never fail to give you praise, honor, and glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray and let the church shout, Amen. While you're being seated, I want to talk a little while on verse 11 where Naaman said, Behold, I thought. And then we want to use the subtitle that we used last week. Your thought life will affect your real life. I want to say that again. Everybody, it's under the sound of my voice. Your thought life will affect your real life. I, for one, here today really love this story about Naaman. Amen. From all outward appearance, amen, Naaman had it going on. I mean, brother, he was somebody to be with. The Bible tells us in 2 Kings 5 and verse 1 uh, that Naaman was a captain. That means he was a leader. He was a great man with his master. He had political pull uh, with the, the, the leader of Syria. The Bible said he was an honorable man. Uh, the word of God tells us that God granted him deliverance uh, in, in battles he fought. He was mighty. He he was a brave man. He had valor. But underneath all of this, underneath his fine uniform uh, was a disease that he couldn't get rid of. Uh, and, and, and the Bible says uh, that he was a leper. Amen. And how many today as we look around the country and the nation uh, that we live in, uh, the same could be said about it. Them. Amen. They've got uh, a lot going for them. Uh, but underneath all of this uh, uh, stuff that they got go going for them is a gnawing and a glaring disease uh, that is killing them. Uh, it, could, it, it could be many things. It could be uh, low self-esteem. It could be hatred, uh, unforgiveness, sorrow, depression, loneliness, uh, fear, or uh, rejection, uh, or even sin. Amen. Sin can uh, come in the form of all colors, but the truth of the matter is uh, we can dress it up. Uh, we can doll it up. We can perfume it up. Uh, amen. But it's still wrong. Amen. Uh, and we are all know it and something that never ceases to amaze me about God is how that God often he can use the most unlikely candidates to get help for us and to us and he did the same to Naaman amen because out on Naaman one of his military expeditions he they, they bring back some slaves and in the monks of those slaves of the defeating people that they come up against was a little Israelite maid 
married, amen, a young girl. And the Bible says uh, in 2 Kings 5, verse 2 and 3, uh, and the Syrians had gone out by companies and they had brought away captive uh, out of the land of Israel a little maid. Uh, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She was just a caregiver. Uh, she was a nanny. She was somebody to clean house, uh, amen. And the Bible says, and she said unto her mistress, uh, would God, my Lord, speaking of Naaman, were with the prophet uh, that is in Samaria, for he would recover him uh, of his leprosy. So God has got this little woman uh, with a little word, uh, amen, to, uh, to the wife of Naaman uh, on how that he can get what he wants, uh, amen. Now this brings me to the text, uh, amen. Naaman shows up at the preacher's house, uh, and, and, and there he has this preconceived idea of how things are going to play out, uh, amen. And we should never forget this, church. We can, I'm going to just tell you flat out, uh, I can't figure it out, amen. Uh, but I want to tell you about a God that's already got it figured out. Uh, he has declared the end from the beginning. Uh, nothing takes him by surprise. Uh, the word of God tells us in the book of Daniel, amen, that God sets up kings and he brings them down. Uh, brother, God is very much in control, amen. Uh, and that's just the truth about it. Uh, and the Bible says in Isaiah 55 verse 8, God said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts and neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. The truth of the matter is the word of God teaches us that in, in far too many cases, we don't, we don't act like God wants us to act. We don't think like God wants us to act, uh, think and we don't do what God wants us to do. And here's the reason Solomon said in Proverbs 14 and 12, he said there is a way that seems right uh, unto a man uh, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Amen. It looks right. It feels right. Uh, it, it, it even looks like you're going right uh, but the Bible says the end result uh, from following man is death. Amen. Then the Bible tells us in Isaiah 55 and verse 9, uh, for as the heavens are higher than the earth uh, so, uh, so are my ways higher than your ways uh, and, and, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen. Uh, Thank God. So I can, I can almost get a mental picture of this when I read the Bible and I, I read these great stories of what's going on in somebody's life and, uh, and I try to make them applicable to my life because I'm going to tell you, you're looking at a preacher that needs a little help along the way. Uh, and, and, and I, you know, I wonder sometimes, God, uh, what can I get out of this story of this uh, military leader, this successful soldier, amen, this honorable man, uh, this man that's got character character about him. He's got valor and bravery, but he's sick. He's got a, a, an awesome disease underneath all that. And I give this mental picture, amen, of, of Naaman uh, uh, coming, pulling him to the preacher's driveway, uh, amen, in, in his chariots pulled by blazing white stallions, uh, amen, with his uniform and his medals, uh, medals of honor shining in the noonday sun, uh, amen. And the preacher doesn't even come out to, to greet him, amen. Ain't that amazing? My God, the people's changed a lot. You let a dignitary show up at a preacher's house, uh, he won't tell the servant to go out there. He'll go out there, but not this preacher. And I'm gonna tell you, God is not only using Elisha, amen, for the message of how to get Naaman better, but he's gonna lose, uh, use Elisha, but not even showing this dignitary the respect that he thought he was due, amen, by even gracing him with this presence, amen, because Naaman is full of pride, amen, and you're going to see this, the Bible says in verse 9 through 12, so Naaman came with his horses, and that's like driving up in a Cadillac, amen, in this day he shows up with his horses and with his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha, and Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean, it says, but Naaman was wroth, my God, if I'm sick and you can give me the remedy how to get better, I'm going to get happy, but he didn't get happy because 
because he's full of pride and I'm a soldier and I'm a captain uh, and I pulled up here in a blazing white stallion uh, pulling my chariot with my wonderful uniform on uh, and you won't even come out and say hello, amen. Uh, and, he, and, and Naaman is angry. And I learned something a long time ago, amen, that's really humbled me in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 9. It says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. And I want to, I got to bound to admit I've been a fool in my life. I mean, uh, I, 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 I am what I am. I've got a type A personality. When I was much younger, I was high strung. Uh, and, and I'm not proud of all that, but I'm telling you, God's got a way of using life to humble you. Amen. And that's just the truth about it. But Naaman was anything but humble. And, and he's angry and he gets upset. And, uh, and the Bible says that anger rests in the bosom of a fool. Amen. And and man, he's crazy because he's leaving and not using what he needs to get him where he needs to be. And the Bible says that, he, that Naaman was wroth and he went, went away and he said, Behold, I thought... See, he had this preconceived idea of how it was going to happen. He said, I thought surely that the preacher would come out to me. After all, I'm a captain. And stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. He, he had a little bit of knowledge of how that ordinarily a prophet would act in order to get in touch before God to help somebody. And he said, and to strike his hand on the place, uh, he knowed about the laying on of hands, how that they shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover, amen, and strike his hand over the place, this, uh, this terrible sore, this leprosy that I have, and recover the leper. And then he said, he began to question the word of God. That's what the devil wants everybody to do, is to question the word of God. Are not Abner far apart rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel may I not wash them and be clean so he turned and he went away in a rage he is red faced rip roaring angry amen James 1 and verse 20 says amen for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God and he's leaving there in a rage and how many people gets the word from God that will deliver them amen exactly from what they don't want into what they desperately need. But because it's not what they want to hear, they get angry and they, 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 they leave in a, in, in a rage and this rage actually blinds their heart. And I can just see Naaman Amen, cracking that whip across the rear end of that blazing white stallion. Uh, amen, as the horses, uh, amen, jerks that chariot with a force, amen, that only an animal can give, uh, amen. And, and, and he's slinging gravel and dust uh, from the preacher's driveway in a fit of rage, amen. Uh, and he, like many today, drove away from the very thing, uh, amen, that if you will, or the very one, uh, amen, that could deliver him from what's bothering him and that's the way it is my God people will come to church and they'll, they'll say the preacher preached on me listen I could preach on tithing and it, it could convict you it doesn't matter the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword piercing even to divide and asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart and I'm not preaching on you I'm preaching to you and I'm telling you there's a leprosy that's eating the fabric of our society up uh, and it's called sin. It's rebellion uh, against the known will of God but I'm here to declare there is a God in heaven that loved us so much uh, that he sent his son to set us free and it's like the song they sung. Uh, he can break every chain. Uh, he can break every chain. Uh, he will break every chain. Amen. And set the captive free. But I thank God that after he showed himself in a fit of rage, slinging gravel and dust all over the place, a man running them poor horses crazy, I thank God that God in his mercy, that God is a God of second chances. Amen. He, God, because of his grace and his mercy, delivers all of us from our thoughts of rage. Amen. And these thoughts of rage actually fosters uh, blindness in the hearts of people 
So in verse 13 of 2 Kings 5, the word of God says in his servants, sometimes church, we need people to talk to us. Sometimes we need people to say, hey buddy, are you sure about this? Amen. Are you really sure that that's what you want to do? Amen. I got a bound to tell this and then we'll move right on. Uh, amen. We, we was up there. This when Jordan was a senior in high school and uh, we played not central at not central, which is a, it's a hostile environment to be in, to say the least. Anybody that's followed these high school games and after the game was over with, we, we actually lost that game with a point uh, oh three seconds to go. I mean, it wasn't even a half, a, what, wasn't a half a second left. Lost it with foul shots. Crazy. And we still lost the game. But anyway, the long story short that I went out, we walked out of the building. And when we got outside, them not central fans was running with them big flags like that. Those three big old robust boys come up to this one guy and not tell you his name. Not tell you who he was. But man, they, they, they was wanting to, they was wanting to, they, they, was, they was wanting to whip on somebody. And this guy from Breathitt County that they was three against one wanted to whip on. I was standing back looking at all that's happening. Some deputy from Breathitt County said, said, man, I'm a deputy and them guys ain't having none of that. They want to whip on somebody. And, 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 and uh, when, when they was picking on this boy, young senior football player, narrowing it down now, figure it out who it is. Uh, and uh, he said, are you sure you want to do this? And them three guys took that as he was backing down and afraid. And um, they just kept advancing. And he said, are you sure you want to do this? And man, they was real sure now. And that guy ripped his Leatherman jacket off. Son, he knocked one of them flat of their rear end. He punched that other one right in the face and the other and left Dodge waving his little flag getting out of there. They, they bit off more than they could choose. I'm going to tell you sometimes, church, uh, hey man, you can bite off more than you can chew. Uh, but what I want to tell you, sometimes, hey amen, uh, we, we need somebody to pull us aside. You see, he didn't want to fight those boys. Uh, he said, are you sure this is what you want to do? Uh, hey man, well, I'll tell you, after the fact, they found out that really was uh, what they wanted to do. But now let's get back to the Bible. The Bible says in his servant, I mean, Naaman is the captain and here's the servants. They came near and they spake unto him and they said, my father, if, if the prophet, I want to tell you something, if that preacher had bid you do some great thing, you know why a lot of people can't never do nothing for God? It's too big for them. It's too, it's too small for them. You say, I'm going to tell you something. I love telling this to people. When you get called to God, you get the preacher's itch. And sometimes you think the only thing that can scratch your itch is to get a big platform. But you're looking at somebody right now. You know what I started out when God called me? I started out teaching the little Sunday school children. Five-year-old, little bitty children. And then I got up to the nine to the 12-year-olds. And then I got up to the teenagers. That's the hardest bunch that I ever talked, tried to tell, I mean, they'd be flirting with one another, chewing bubble gum, blowing bubbles, and, uh, and I didn't realize that they could, they were still listening, amen, but anyway, and then I got the adult uh, uh, Sunday school class and, uh, and, and all that, but I, I just wanted to do something, listen, if, 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 if this is an eternal truth, if you are too big to do small things, then you are without a doubt too small to do big things for God. I want to say that again. If you're too big to do small things, then there is no doubt in my mind that you're too little to do big things for God. I've noticed that God has a tendency to use small things. Now let's look at these. These small servants that was in submission to Naaman, they come now with what Naaman needed to hear. He said, Naaman, I want to tell you something, Father. If, if, if that preacher had bid you do some great thing, would us thou not have done it? Well, sure he would have. How much rather then when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. Every preacher Sunday, this Sunday, is going to tell you if you'll come to Jesus, he'll save you. That's, that's how small it is. If you'll call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. So we need to never forget what the prophet said in Zechariah 4 and verse 10. He said, for who hath despised the day of small things? Small things. Listen, God uses small things. It was a small family 
of eight, four women and four men that God used to build the ark and save the world. It was a small boy who led blind Samson to the pillars of Dagon's temple and so he could push it down and destroy the enemies of God. It was a small teenage boy that killed the giant of Gath. It was a small cloud about the size of a man's head that ended a three and a half year drought in Israel. It was a small lad who Jesus used his lunch of five barley loaves and two small fishes to feed 5,000 men plus women and children. And let us never forget that it was a small babe born in the small town of Bethlehem of Judea to a small woman that God used to save the world. Naaman said in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 11, he said, but I thought. Naaman was wroth and went away and said, behold, I thought. Often we need God to place someone in our lives to help change our thinking. Often we need God to put someone in our lives to change our thinking. Verse 13, they said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? Of course, how much rather when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. Paul said in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you, and that means I call your attention to this, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you offer your body as a living sacrifice. I've heard people say in church, I die for the Lord, and every time I hear it, hear it I, I want to say, man, God ain't asking you to die for him, he's asking you to live for him. <laughs> if you live for him, everything else is going to be all right that you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the truth of the matter is, when the Bible says in Romans 12 and 2, by the renewing of your mind, a, remo a renewed mind is a changed mind. And at the, the, the beckoning of the servants of Naaman, Naaman changed his mind. He had his mind renewed. He ain't thinking right. All he can say is that old dirty water, I don't want to get in it. Amen. But the servants changed his mind. A renewed mind is a changed mind. A changed mind, amen, thinks differently. So Naaman had to change his thinking. It made sense, church, to wash in Abna and Firepire, because they were clean rivers. The river Jordan was muddy, and no doubt in Naaman's way of thinking, it, the mud that's swirling up in the river Jordan would fill his leprous sores with dirt, debris, and germs. However, the Word of God works, church. In Ephesians 17, verses, uh, uh, chapter 4, there ain't 17 chapters in Ephesians. There's only six. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 23, to me this is a perfect word picture of what Naaman did, amen, in his fit of rage. It says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And you see, there might be people in this service today, man, you can see really well, but you're stone blind when it comes to spiritual things. And the Bible tells us why people are stone blind spiritually. In 2 Corinthians 10, or 4, verse 3 and 4, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God, little g, not our God, but the devil, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Lest, there's some hope there, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ to his image of God should shine unto them. And the Bible says, who be in past feeling, verse 19 of Ephesians 4, 
have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ as so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in, as is in Jesus. That you put off concerning the former conversation. That doesn't mean the way you talk. It means the way you live, the old man. Naaman had to die to Naaman and to his pride and to his position, amen, and submit to God, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And the Bible says in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. But I love what the New Living Translation says in Ephesians 4 and verse 23. It said, instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. I'm going to tell you something that really blowed my boat out of the water the night I got saved. I could not understand that. I still can't understand it. I went went into that church, man, empty, dead, rotten, destroyed on the inside. I was just like Naaman. Man, I was dressed up and, and, and had material things, not bragging, but I had, I had a lot more than I started with. I'm going to just tell you that. And I walked into that church, but my heart was full of the leprosy and of rebellion. Amen. And, and, and I went to that altar and I got saved. And, and I'm telling you right now what really to this day astounds me. When I got up out of that altar, my thinking was different. I I, I love the things I used to hate and hated the things I used to love and I walked out there a brand new creature in Christ Jesus because old things uh, had passed away and behold, God has made all things new. Amen. I walked out there, church, not in a fit of rage, uh, but man crying like a little baby. I couldn't understand it. I was so happy I couldn't stand it and big tears rolling down my cheeks. I didn't want to cry in front of nobody, but I was just so happy, man, for what God had done on the inside. But the, you know what he done? Amen. He let his spirit renew my thought and attitude. I walked out there with a different attitude. Verse 24 of Ephesians 4 says, and that you put on the new man. I'm, they sing that song I Put, tuck off the old coat and put on the new. Well, right there it is in the Bible. When you get saved, you put on the new man. My wife got a new husband that night. That's just the God's truth about it. Hey, uh, my son, I only had one son at that time. Uh, he got a new daddy that night because old things had passed away. That night, that Friday night, because of Calvary's finished work of Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, uh, I put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. At the word and guidance of Naaman's servants through the obedience uh, to his wor- to the word of God, he put on the new man, Naaman did. Verse 14, and they went down. Sometimes you have to go down before you can get up, church. Naaman went down. He went down out of his chariot. He went down from the river bank. He went down in the water, that old muddy river Jordan. And he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. You know, I, I just love little, little babies. I really do. They smell so good. Their, their skin's so soft. I mean, I just want to pinch them, not hurt them, just squeeze on them. But, amen. Praise God. And, and Annie, she's a big tease. I'm going to just tell you. Uh, uh, we, we, when we pick her up, my wife will be back in the back seat with her in the car seat. And, and then when we get her out of there, I'll say, give Papa sugar. And, and she said, no. And she's got to give it to Mama, you know. It's amazing how mischievous that children can be so young. Amen. And then she figures stuff out. If she wants something Papa's got, she knows what to do to get it. Sugar. But I like to kiss on them big fat jaws because they're soft and she smells good. And all babies are like that. And I was telling somebody the other day, not revealing nobody, I said, ain't. We was in a crowd, me and some other people, and they started talking about babies. I said, I ain't never seen an ugly baby. Somebody in the crowd said, I have. <laughs> People's awful, church. I've seen some ugly adults, but I ain't seen any ugly babies. I mean, they're just all pretty to me. Now you're saying, who's the preacher thinks ugly? Man, I look at him in the mirror every morning. 
I get scared sometimes. I feel so young on the inside, and I look at that guy, and I say, who's that old man looking back at me? Amen. But anyway, let's go on. Church is about over. It's 12.01. Give me 10 minutes, and we'll try to wind this thing up. He went down. His flesh come. When he obeyed God, he got his flesh back like a little child. Look, look, look what he did next. After he got out of that old river muddy, muddy, man, his uniform's dirty now. The water, the muddy Jordan, it's all over that blazing uh, chariot that them horses is pulling. Amen, he just messed up everything. But it doesn't matter now because he got what he wanted. And the Bible says in verse 15, and he returned to the man of God, the one he left mad at, the one that he misunderstood, the one that he thought in a preconceived idea or how he's supposed to treat him. And the Bible says that he went back to the man of God. Amen. He and all of his company and came and stood before him and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. He's going to give him gifts. And Elisha ain't like a lot of preachers I know. Man, Gehazi is... But he, didn't, he said, I, ain't, I don't want nothing. I don't want nothing you got, man. I just want you to know who God is. And he came through. He came through the word of God, the word of Elisha, which is the word of God. And this is how he got his healing of his leprosy. And he came by this to the knowledge of the true and living God. But here's what I want you to see. See, Naaman had been used to going to the temple of the pagan god which is no god at all but an idol of Rimmon. and the bible says he said to the preacher he said Elisha he said I want to tell you something for thy servant will henceforth he said I'm a changed man for thy servant from henceforth will offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods but unto the Lord Amen. he said I'm going to serve God but here's what really amazes me. He said, you know, because of the position I'm in, I'm going to have to go into that pagan temple. He said, but when I go in there, I'm not going to worship that pagan God. Verse 18, look at it. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Remnon, which is an idol God, to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Remnon, the Lord pardon my ser thy servant. God forgive me. He said, because I'm going to serve God. I want to tell you something, church. As they come and get us a song. Some, listen, we're, we're living in a nation that on the most part is serving ever God, little g, except the true and the living God. Amen. And that's just the God's truth. And, and, and they can't figure it out. I, I think about Romans chapter 1, how the, that Paul said to the church at Rome, he said, professing themselves to be wise, they've become fools. And it's amazing. Listen, you can have a bachelor's degree and still be an idiot. Don't you get offended at me. I'm just telling you right now, they can put people in the heavens. They can walk on the moon. They can shoot them down in a submarine and walk on the ocean's floor, and they can't figure out what's wrong with America. And it's real simple, church. Buddy, God's a gentleman. If you don't want him in your life, he'll still be God and you'll be destroyed. God said in Psalms 9 and verse 17, it says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. I was talking to some of the Samaritan purse workers and, and see, I'm getting a little blue because they're getting close to being time for them to leave here and I've formed a lasting relationship with them and, 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 and they're going to be some of them I'll never see again in this life, but I've got a hope of seeing them in heaven. But I want to tell you something. These people that have stayed here and been so gracious to help this community, they could never forget me if they had not never met me. They could have never forgotten this church had they not at one time known this church. And no nation could ever forget God. You can't forget someone that you've never met or never known about. 
But God said through Paul in Romans 1, professing themselves to be wise, they've become fools. They've worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forevermore. And three times in Romans chapter 1, it says, and God gave them up, and God gave them up, and God gave them over. And in the literal Greek translation of that, it is this. It gives the analogy of a ship on a troubled sea, and it says it means abandoned by God. Church, in Revelation 2.21, there was a false prophetess by the name of Jezebel in the church at Thyatira. And God said, I gave her a space to repent. A space is the distance from that wall to those doors back there. I gave her a space, a length of time, a distance to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Therefore, I will cast her uh, into the bed of affliction and I'm going to kill her children with death. I'm going to tell you, church, we're in trouble. The church ain't. Our nation is. We celebrate this month. We don't. Some do. What God calls an abomination. That same thing that's being celebrated the month of June waves the rainbow flag, which was a covenant promise of God. They took something good and made something bad out of it. Which was a covenant promise of God that I will not destroy the world with water again. That's why you see a rainbow. Church, there's amazing, listen, there's amazing God up there. But God, listen, they come out with something because they, too, and I'm going to say this and shut up and hear me. They call it intelligent design. Listen, everything about this world, it, for you to think that the Big Bang Theory is true, you'd have to believe that I can take a stick of dynamite down there in the junkyard and light it and throw it in there and it'll blow out a Cadillac. That's how stupid that is. But there are seven colors in the rainbow. You ought to, you ought to research that number seven in the Bible. Amen. Seven years of tribulation, seven years of famine, seven years of plenty. Just on and on and on and on and on. Amen. Seven continents, seven oceans. You think that just happened because Darwin thought that something run into each other and it blowed all that out? And then the scientist knows this whole world's stamped with a three. That tree that made that beam is three. It has bark, sap, and pulp. Time is divided by three, past, present, and future. An atom is made up of three, a electron, a neutron, and a proton. God is three, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Man is three, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I pray God that He sanctify holy your spirit, soul, and body. I am a spirit, I have a soul, and I live in a body. There's three dispensation, on, even though there's seven actually, but there, that's, that, there's three primarily. The dispensation of the Father, which is all in the Old Bible. The dispensation of the Son, that's the Gospels. And the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, which is now the church. God's a God of order. And that's why you're in church today. And I'm going to shut up because I want to tell you something. Man, it's like Steve said. He asked the question, are you rapture ready? There's going to be a time when there'll be two in the field and one's going to be taken and the other left. About six months after we got married, my wife got saved. And I've been reared in church. I wasn't a Christian, but man, I, I knew enough about the Lord that I knew the Lord was going to come sometime. Sometimes I'd wake up in the middle of the night and reach over there to make sure she was still there. I didn't want to be left behind. They're going to be two women grinding up the meal. The one will be taken and the other left. There's coming a separating time. 
And what's going to determine whether or not you go or stay is you. Because God's made a way. As they sing for the Lord and you, how about it, friend? The ball is in your court. What are you going to do with Jesus who is called Christ? Are you going to shout away with him, let him be crucified? Or are you going to say, Lord, I'm going to get it right this Sunday. I'm going to make my calling and my election sure with you this Sunday.